Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the latest instalment of This Is Unionist Voices uh, 20th anniversary series of the RUC to the PSNI. And throughout the course of the week, we've been hosting discussions with a wide range of different people. Tonight's one of the most hotly anticipated ones. Um, uh, I'm going to be engaging in a conversation with Joe Blally, who is a well-known uh, nationalist commentator, a GAA legend. I don't know much about GAA, but my, my friends that do tell me that, that Mr. Blally is the Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi uh, of, 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 of the GAA. So, um, look, it's, it's great to have you, Joe, and thanks very much for taking the opportunity. It's, it's a pleasure. I was supposed to come to your soccer tournament to present medals and elect you down, so uh, this is the least I can do. Again, we'll get you again. I played soccer Uh, once. I played soccer for a full season for the Strammilla Strollers, and I was offside, I think, at least 100 times. Eventually, the manager (laughs) used to run along beside me on the sideline and say, go now, go now. (laughs) You're doing worse. Um, Look, Joe, let's start off. Obviously, you're a lot older than me. Um, Take a, I'm not sure... Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, but what so age are you? 31. 31. So my experience of, of the RUC is, is almost viewed through the prism of, of uh, books I've read and other people's accounts. Obviously, you, as a nationalist, lived for you know much of your life with the RUC. Um, I mean, what was, what was your views of the RUC or what do you think about it? Well... The, I mean, I was born in 1969, so really all I re, all I remembered as a child was the Troubles. I was born in Dungiven, uh, and you know, very quickly it was them and us. The um, the first killing of the Troubles was uh, a man called Francie McCluskey in Dungiven, and he was 67 years of age, a bachelor, a farmer. He was in to do his grocery shopping. There'd been an orange parade in the town and Francie died in the doorway of Hassan's draper shop and he died from blunt force trauma to the head and anyone who was there had said, look, that it was an attack by members of the RUC. No one was ever arrested. No one was ever charged. And very quickly, that was in, I think, July 1969. Very quickly thereafter, the troubles kicked off and all of a sudden... You know, there was no come along with the police at all. Certainly, by the time I was a child, that I can remember, you weren't to talk to the police. You weren't to take anything to do with them. They were the enemy, you know, and it was very much a them and us. And we were a very small nuclear community. We were locked into that. And um, they were they were to be feared and to be suspicious of, you know. So they weren't served in the shops. No one spoke to them. You know, apart from to call them black bastards and the SS or UC and all of that. And then very quickly, Jimmy, um, you know, the civil rights led to serious, serious violence. You know, you had an internment where there were a lot of, you know, sort of four or five school teachers in Dungiven who were seen as leaders of civil rights and possibly more than that were arrested, weren't charged, weren't tried with anything. And you think of like, up to a thousand people being taken away into an internment camp. We didn't know. I mean, my father was interned. We we didn't know what was going to happen to him. After three years, we got a phone call to the next door neighbour, um, who was a Protestant fellow who had a phone. He came to the house and he knocked the door and he said, Anne, you have to go and pick up Francie at the maze. The year. At Long Cash. Yeah, three years he was away. And so, you know, there was a sense of, we are under attack from the state. And so that was that. I mean, police were part of the enemy forces, the soldiers, obviously. And then you had a situation where um, young police officers coming out of their house, being shot in the face, booby trap bombs, you know, all of the horrors around that. And all the time, it was just getting more and more and more intense. You know, you led into the hunger strikes. I was 11 or 12 then. And the whole state was erupting then. And I think that, I mean, I certainly wouldn't have liked being a police officer during that time. And, yeah. you know, there was, there was very much a sense of how could it not be? Like, if your colleagues are being murdered, well, you're going to be angry about that. And 
it was very much from our community seen as a Protestant police force for Protestant people, and that was the way it was. Yeah, I, I was actually just going to come down. Glad you said that, but at the end, because actually I've been doing some uh, discussions this week with ex loyalist prisoners, um, Billy Hutchison and, and 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 Jim Wilson. Or Jim Wilson's contribution was out yesterday, Tuesday, and Billy's on on Monday night. Um, and and surprisingly, obviously, again, as somebody who um, has grown up largely in the post RUC era, I would have uh, had quite a a positive view of the RUC, quite a supportive view of the RUC. Um, but 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 interestingly, actually, when I spoke to Billy and Jim, who are, again, obviously a lot older than me and experienced the RUC, actually they said that, that they felt that the RUC was bad to them as as right, they were right, to... Right, right. As, but I as think that's were. inevitable because it's all about our own personal experience, Jimmy. You're like, I didn't know anybody who was in the RUC. Nobody. And nobody I knew knew anybody who was in the RUC. Like, entire community of maybe two and a half thousand people. Like, we did not know a single person. And the beginning of empathy, the beginning of understanding anyone else is, I know you, so I know what you're going through and I can empathize. And, uh, and so with the schooling system being as it was, with the fact that we lived in entirely different areas and never got to meet each other, there was no social media. I mean, it would have been a huge thing. If you joined the RUC, you had to move out. You had to go somewhere else. You had to go and live in Bangor. You know, and then you had to be taken under your car every morning. And you were then persona non grata. You were, you know, you've yeah. joined the enemy team, so you can fuck off. And that's the way it was. You know, it was it was the harsh reality of, you know, that sort of tremendous civil strife. You know, and that's yeah. why it's important that people like you are very careful about your words because all we got during that entire time was this inflammatory. So you had some people, moderates, you know, you had people like John Hume saying, Jesus, we've got like seriously, there's another way to do this. Like we cannot, what are we gonna do? Like we'll kill each other, or there's nobody left. And so I the best way I could put it to you is this. I cannot believe how quickly we've established peace. I just can't believe it. My children, like my oldest boy is 21, 22. He doesn't know anything about this. His friends who are Protestants don't make any difference to him. You know, he lives in an entirely different world, a middle-class, safe Belfast world, you know, which would have been undreamed of 25 years ago. And so, you know, for me, the PSNI has been just a, just another part of a sensational peace process. And we see that every day. I mean, it used to be like, I mean, 300 RUC men were shot dead and bombed. Like, that's a huge damage to a community, their families. You know, the ripple effect of that, the anger and the rage that it causes, the hurt. You know, and yet you're, you're 31 years of age, so you wouldn't really remember that at all, you know. But do you, do, do, do you concede and, and, and actually... Went into a little bit there, the wider peace process, and, and actually we'll, we'll, we'll come to a wee bit about that. But do, do you concede that that for um, people who served in the RUC, who seen things, uh, colleagues murdered um, by the IRA, and 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 what you seem to describe is this situation was just got out of control, and, and the RUC was seen as the enemy, and and maybe the RUC when you're checking under your car every morning and you're getting blown up, maybe seen nationalist communities who they would have viewed as harboring the IRA to some extent as as the enemy. Do, do you see from those persons how they might feel that, that the RUC has been uh, dehumanised and, and, and sacrificed on on the the altar uh, of the, the, the so-called peace process? And actually when they look at, at, well, at the think, IRA, that, it hasn't I happened. Can, yeah. I think that there's such an intense, there, was, there would be such intense emotional involvement you know, you're an RUC man, you know, your colleague gets murdered. You know, there's going to be such intense emotional involvement that there comes a point it's very, very difficult to see beyond that. I mean, for me, the role model in these things are people like Alan McBride. You know, his wife was murdered in the Frizzell bomb. Hmm. His father-in-law, Des, was killed. And, you know, you look at that remarkable human being what he is contributing to Northern Ireland society, like what he's contributing through wave trauma, you know, 
the message that he preaches day in, day out. I mean, that's the role model for all of us, to be colorblind, to be blind to religion, you know, to be blind to difference, you know, which is why when you said to me, look, come down to the soccer tournament, it's an absolute pleasure for me, you know. I mean, I, I, I um, have always taken the view that human life is sacred and should not be taken. You call me a nationalist commentator. I wouldn't really see myself as a nationalist commentator. I mean, I happen to grow up in a different society than you, but I see that had I been born in your society, you know, I might have been a Protestant, but wouldn't really have made any difference to me, you know. And anyway, show you, every, everybody knows that since fa that since Father Ted, the Catholic Church was completely destroyed. <laughs> nobody takes it. Nobody takes it seriously anymore. Anyway, and you know, increasingly elderly people go on, and the the idea of you know Roman Catholics and Protestants, I think, is becoming increasingly outdated. And I think our our my kids, for example, um, just like. They just think it's a bit weird to hear sectarian goings on and to to hear sort of inflammatory words. They just think it's weird. It's There's like, probably a difference right? between. Um, I mean, I never took the view that I know it's probably an easy easy stereotype, but I never took the view that that the conflict and our political differences was about Protestants and Catholics. I mean, we weren't fighting over what Martin Luther nailed to the, um, you know, Martin Luther Luther's theses or or theological issues. We were fighting over. Uh, well, two communities yeah. were fighting over um, national identity, uh, so it was a question of nationality rather than a question. Well, I think of it was leader. more. I think it was more basic than that. I mean, the history of the state tells us that it was about domination, a Protestant Parliament for a Protestant people, James Craig, you know, Basil Brook, like I wouldn't have a Catholic about the place or the enemy of the state, their subversives, all of that. The fact that the state was set up through a simple sectarian head count, you know, well, look, will we take six counties? Do we take four? Is that enough? Do we take nine? You know, and I suppose it's it's the legacy that colonization, imperialization has left has left in many parts of the world where I mean the Spanish did this as well. You go, you colonize, then you give part of the colony its, its freedom because it's just too hot, you know, there's just the population there is too big, you haven't been able to settle it properly, you haven't been able to keep it under control. And then you take the smaller part, you take part of the colony, but sooner or later. Sooner or later, it's it's going to come apart, you know. And sooner or later, people are going to say, "Look, you know, we need a representative police force. Look, we need a bit of fair play here. We can't have gerrymandering. We need votes. We need all those sorts of things." And so, the reason that there's no chance of a return to violence is because the North now has has made massive strides in just making people look. I've got, I've got, I feel a piece of this society now. I like this society. You know, and I'm 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 content that I that but I get a fair shot at things. I mean, then that's that's really all it is. That's yeah, all it is. There, there's large sections of of the, the loyalist community, especially, but but the unionist community who do feel that the and and this does play into policing a little bit, and we'll come on to the specifics of that. But who do does feel as if as as the place of peace is that that our community. Uh, has to engage in a process which is uh, I term it a process of self self harm, which is the the incremental um, dismantling of the union, and we have to participate in that process as a bit of peace. And that and that does create a little bit of well, quite a lot of resentment well, among many people. I mean, is it not the case that, that we're on the path at the minute, and, and is it not a legitimate feeling for people in my community to say, well, what you described feeling in nineteen sixty nine, to to in a different context. That's how many people in my community feel now. I mean, I mean, we feel that. I, I understand it, but I think it's rhetor rhetorical. I don't think it's real. You know, I think that that. But who, who the, determines the, the, the Protestant who, culture? The Protestant culture and the and the the day to day life that you lead means that you are who you wish to be, and no one's going to interfere with that. You know, you 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 you, you know you you have you have very different pursuits. You know, you play, you enjoy different games. You, 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 you know, you've got a terrific tradition with the with the bands and all of that, with the July the twelfth, all those sorts of things, and you've got those freedoms. You know, you're protected from discrimination in the workplace. You know, you're protected. I mean, we have we have the strongest anti discrimination laws in the world in the north. You've got. I mean, I I see there that you're a. And I had to say, I had to ask you about this. It says that you're a, le a legal executive. A member of the Legal <laughs> Executives Institute. Started, yes, the, 
the chartered institute. It's a chartered institute, like the those the people tribunals and stuff. So, um, as as we're saying before, we go on. Well, we we had the, the this week we had an entertaining <laughs> day before the um the, the lady chief justice and and Lord Justice yeah. McCloskey. I don't expect you to make any comment on that, Joe. And there's another. Have- there's another thing: the absolute impartiality of the judiciary. You know, and I mean, I was struck. When I, 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 I've always, as you know, supported the PSNA from day one, whenever you were sitting with maybe 6 or 7% Catholics after its formation, I supported it 100% because my view was, you know, you need a, a police service where it's just a job. There's nothing to do with who you are. It makes no difference, you know. And, and so I supported that from day one. And I've always made the point that it's, and, and this is, recognize it's the most scrutinized publicly scrutinized police service in the world and you say like well what what threat is there from a police service which is just a job to anybody i mean regardless of your religion regardless of your I mean, what threat does that hold for anyone i mean i, I noticed I, I i mean and i was very pleased to see it because i did think it was very very successful disappointing that the catholic numbers are sort of sitting at around 30 percent and not moving especially west of the ban, because you want a situation where, like, I've got pals here in the police service. I can go and have a drink with them. There's no threat. They don't have to move out. They don't have to feel that there's any stigma around it. I think all that's changing in the next 30 years. That will all be gone completely, and it will just be a job. But in the White House task force report on policing in the 21st century, the conclusion was that, that the PSNI is the model for global policing. It's how to enhance community relations. It's how to have proper oversight. It's how to have civilian oversight. All the layers that are there, I would have thought that, especially a young fellow now like yourself who's interested in the law and interested in, in, in all of those very important concepts like fairness that can be objectively guaranteed, all those things, I would have thought that people would say, well, look, this is terrific. Well, this is terrific. Well, I mean, you know, you experience a criminal court day in, day out. I mean, there, there, there's questions to be asked of, of some of the, the conduct of, of, of the PSNI. And, I mean, people... Again, it's all minor. It's very, very minor stuff, Jimmy. Like, I, I'm at the cold face oh. in there. And and you're talking about very, very minor stuff now. I mean, a police officer makes a misjudgment. But in terms well, of... A, 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 in, in, terms of in terms of the confidence... Of the community now. I mean, whenever I was a kid growing up, nobody rang the police. If you if you if you had an issue in the community, you didn't ring the police. You, know, but, you, but rang, I, you rang a different I, number. <laughs> I, <laughs> now, I don't think I, now I, you know, and and the police can the police can can uh, you know. I mean, the police are on bicycles now in Belfast. I mean, it's, it's sometimes I see them on the bikes, and I'm thinking to myself, you see, uh, you, you think of pulling up and say, look, are you sure you're safe? <laughs> I mean, I remember going into Belfast Town Centre, and you wouldn't remember this, but I, mean, I remember going in. There was a ring of steel. It was like turnstiles going into a match. The the searchers had Alsatian dogs, and you had to be searched, and you had to get a metal detector before you could come into the city centre. I mean, now, those sorts of... I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw a police checkpoint. Yeah. I mean, and whenever well, I was going around, it, like the army were everywhere. You couldn't move anywhere. You couldn't go anywhere. Like if we were going to a GA match, you were like out of the car, everything thrown out of the car. Sometimes take the, <laughs> the big soldier took the keys out of my ignition once. And you know, I'm always really polite when I meet people. I'm not, like a, not like I'm on the television. He took the keys and he just fired them down over, like it was about 10 o'clock at night. Oh, and there was about five or six of us coming from a football match. I had to get down their hands and knees and search for the keys. You know, again, that was okay when it was war. But now, where there's no there are no conditions whatsoever for civil strife, you know, I think that that as we advance, regardless of what anybody says, regardless of the rhetoric that's out there at the moment. I mean, I've seen you. I've seen you. I don't. I don't mean this in any way. In a little way, like I've seen you standing in wheelie bins, addressing you know seven or eight lads and all that. And, you know, you can, <laughs> no, 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 you know, but you know what I mean by that. And and, and 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 I've seen you talking about you sort of you know the 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 risks that are out there, and all of that. But I don't think it's real. 
you know, I don't but, see anything around me. Like, and I, I do work at the coalface. So, like, I cannot remember, for example, the last time in the courts, and it used to be a daily occurrence. I can't remember the last time there was a sectarian assault in the Crown Courts in Belfast. No, but 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 people in my community do feel genuinely that that we're being squeezed into a corner. And and what you articulate how you felt in 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 nineteen seventies is how many people in my community feel. Uh, and while uh, you accept that that's real, that's a perception. Uh, I mean, we can argue the toss on that. Sure. But it but but I I think what's beyond dispute is for at least a sig a significant minority. Let's let's put it like that: a significant minority. Uh, within the unionist loyalist community, does feel as if we're the people under siege. They do feel that the systems of the state are now weighed against oh, us. Why? And almost right. the but, but let me ask you this: Why? What do you think is going to happen? Like, what do you well, think is going to happen to you that's going to but, impinge on your freedoms, your religious freedoms, your legal rights, all the things that are important in your life, your education? I know people who live in Spain, and they go down to a British bar. And they've got their union jacks and they watch the soccer matches. I mean, I watched I watched England against South Africa in the World Rugby Cup final this year in a bar in You must have had a few drinks, you can't remember. An, an English bar in the south of France, and the expats there were out expressing themselves, singing, drinking, having fun. I mean, what do you think is gonna happen? Oh, but hold on. The we talked about the the, the peace process, and I mean, I, I don't like that term because I think it, it entwines a political process with an absence of violence, and I think those are two different components. Those are two entirely different things. But I mean, what well, well, what do you see as the, you know a process by its definition has to have a beginning and an end? I mean, what do you see as the end of the process? Where does the process end? Well, it just ends with a civilized society where everybody can express themselves as they wish. I mean, it is like with me. Sent to my partner about six weeks ago, look, let's go down and see the orange parades in the city. She brought it down for the crack, you know, she wouldn't have any experience this at all. And, you know, just just standing there in the side of the street, lovely sunny morning, had a coffee, came out, watched the bands. But but that's, that's civilized, not that's civilized society. Yeah, that's civilized not what society. but if, if, I, mean, if I can you remember live... the Ormer Road, I lived on the Ormer Road. I lived on, on, on Rushfield Avenue. And I remember the Ormer Road whenever the orange marches were coming up over the Ormer Road and people were going out onto the streets in the lower Ormo to prevent the marches coming. And the serious violence at that occasion, like the craziness, the craziness. Then you've got kids saying, OK, I'm going to take up a gun. Then you've got kids in the loyalist community saying, right, I'm going to shoot guys too. You know, and then you get into that whole self-defeating cycle, which doesn't make any difference anyway. Yeah, you know, well, no, I don't think anybody, nobody in the mind wants. Violence. Yeah. I mean, definitely. But, but let's never just to, happen. The, the, the push back on the point about, about the process, the end of the process being a civilized society. I mean, yeah. that yeah. that can't be right because because the, the, the process translates itself into the 98 Act. And, and the only end of it is in the 98 Act is a referendum on the United Ireland and a, 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 a perpetual one uh, thereafter until well, the answer is right. yes. Well, no, you can't. So, you can't. You, 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 I mean, you can't blame the Catholics for breeding more than the Protestants. <laughs> but well, but 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 I think but, it was James uh, Craig. It was James Craig who famously said, or not? No, it wasn't James Craig. It was Captain Terence O'Neill said, and it's still one of my favourite lines. He said in 1969, when he was advocating for civil rights, he was saying, "Look, let's switch this off. Look, we can take simple measures that'll switch off civil rights." And he said, "And you know, he'd be probably excellent like that for now." And he said. A paraphrase, but it's more or less accurate. He said, I mean, it's jolly difficult, he said, to persuade the Protestant man, he said, that if the Catholic has a car and a job, then he won't have 18 children. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he subscribed to Northern society. And, uh, you know, you, you, you look around the North now. People are interested in... See, this is what I think about the North now. And it's something that Montague Norman governor of the Bank of England, said to the fledgling American Bankers Association in about 1924, he said, the important thing about the party political system is we've got to support it and bolster it, because with a party political system, we'll have people arguing over issues of no importance, while we, the financiers, get on with the real business of governing the world. And the important issues in our society now are, well, okay, so we've got this like Brexit thing. We've got the protocol. What's the best way that we can take advantage of that for the greater good? 
Financially, how do we benefit from this? We see, for example, that business leaders are saying, okay, our business with the South and our business with Europe is up 70%. How do we take advantage of that? How do we make sure, for example, that as the North becomes more and more attractive for big corporations because of that fact that we've got the best of both worlds, that there are rent controls in place, that people are able to afford housing, you know, that we continue to have a strong NHS, the taxation is properly dealt with. See, those are all the serious issues, Jamie. See, this, those, stuff, this stuff, those, this sort of yaboo stuff about, you know, um, the RUC and the IRA and all that, that's all rhetorical. In the but, end, in my view, it's of no importance. Like, I but, don't but, care what your religion is. I don't yeah. care what you do, but, I'm, but I am interested in you having good prospects. I am interested in every child in the North having good prospects and being treated fairly, you know. And we have serious, serious issues to be dealt with. And we're sitting with a stormant. We're sitting with a stormant. We don't even know when it's opened. Most of the time it's shut. You know, ha, there's, not... no, like, there's no political strategizing. No, but you know that. There's no political strategizing. You know, we don't want we don't want finance powers. We don't want taxation powers, which is the essence of government. You know, these are the things that we need to be concentrating on. But but all of the issues you said, uh, Joe, as 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 positives, right? And, and to some extent, you know, they it seems to be your analysis that they flow from the protocol. But I mean. The logic you know, of that not is not, necess not necessarily. You know the point I'm making there is that that's just one example of something yeah. that 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 if we had a, a strong business led approach to government, we'd be saying, okay, never mind what the Tories are saying. Look what we can do with this. But that Look would require this more advantage. That would See, require political money. instability. Political instability. Yeah, it's, there's no. It's no coincidence that the North is the least privileged part of of the United Kingdom, and has been. There's no coincidence that we've got poverty levels in places in the north that are almost unheard of in Western Europe. You know, but as long as we've got the orange and the green to divide us and we can shout loudly about that and we can give votes for talking about it, then we can avoid those real issues. Yeah. You know, and we can rely we can rely on the UK, we can rely on successive secretaries of state in circumstances where, in my view, Boris Johnson and the Tory government do not care a jot. About a, about a family in the shankle struggling to get by. They don't give a damn about them. At the moment, I believe they're simply using the protocol to up the ante. It's good for votes. In Middle England, you're showing the Jerry and the French what it's all about. You know, all that sort of stuff. But do they care about a family struggling in, 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 in the, the underprivileged areas, you know, the Protestant areas of Belfast or in the North in general? Uh, they don't care about them at all. And I think that the charade that we have, you know, the, the, the sort of charade that is politics here has 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 done us no favours whatsoever. You know, and we've got a very strong, very well-educated populace. We have a terrific business middle class, you know, who have zero interest in politics now. They're just getting on with it. They're just getting on with it. The sooner we move away from the old orange and green thing, and I think we're moving away from it very strongly. I don't think young people are particularly interested in that stuff anymore. Like you look at the dissidents, for example. Nobody's interested. They have zero support. Zero support. About two people go to their parades. No support. I mean that sincerely. People aren't interested in that. They're interested in their kids getting on. They're interested in, you know, they're interested in their communities and helping out where they can. You know, they're interested in the real stuff of everyday life. Yeah, well, look, I suppose, uh, and, and I do have to come back on the protocol point, I mean, because it's a little bit like the, the, the peace process point in that, I mean, for financial advantage or, or whatever, th those potential benefits, I mean, my community is expected to tolerate a border down the, down the RC, uh, our own country. Being... What, what impact does it have on you? Well, 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 put it this way. What, in, what impact would a land border have? What impact would a land border like, have? Are you, doing, are, you do, are you doing business with the UK? <laughs> no, but from an from an identity point of view, I mean, what 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 what? I, just, uh, I can't understand how it compromises your identity. In fact, but would it compromise if there was land border? Like this was this this was touted as a triumph when Boris made the deal. It was a triumph. I mean, he was cheered to the rafters. No, quite that quick. Would 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 if 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 would would infrastructure on the border? 
harm your identity or do you think it would harm if you don't maybe you don't identify as a nationalist but somebody who's tuned into those communities would it harm nationalist communities if there was infrastructure on the border I mean, what harm would it do to the identity i mean is that not the opposite of what you've just said to me no 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 I, I don't think that it is i mean it's a purely business transaction that was agreed by the british government 